and yet I know I have. I know I've done it with things, Lord, that man didn't count for anything. I know I've done it uh, doing things that were not beneficial to me or others. I've wasted time, God, and today I don't want to waste the time of these that got up and got here, that in spite of the weather and everything else, Lord, they came here. I don't want to waste their time, Lord, that they could be used doing something else because, Lord, ultimately, I don't want their time to be spent listening to me. I want it to be hearing from you. And God, I give you thanks that on one hand, like Ashley said earlier in her prayer, we don't deserve even your smile, let alone your grace and your forgiveness and to be called the children of God. On the other hand, Lord, we're thankful that you do and thankful, Jesus, you made that way and opened up for us. But sorry that at times we can take that for granted. And instead of responding with all that you did for us as a friend when we were your enemies, we sometimes go, well, God loves me, so let me have a nice life. So God, today I pray that you would speak through me. I pray that each one that's here would hear something from you, not because I think they need it, and that's just it, Lord, that's the dilemma. And I do pray that you've got me here as a pastor at this church, Lord, with this flock, with these brothers and sisters, because you know that we are alike. And I don't want to presume that anybody's just like me, but God, that we, we do have similar feelings and all and perspectives on things. And maybe, Lord, we do need to shift our perspective, and especially when it comes to you and how do you view things, our life and the world. And God, I'm most of all concerned how you view eternity and, and not to be scared to death or insecure in it, but God, I don't want to take for granted that of course I'm saved if my life doesn't bear forth the fruit like our church and basic part of its name, Lord, that you're the vine, we're the branches. If we abide in you, we'll bear much fruit. So God, help us to examine and look at our fruit. Help us to see, are we bearing anything that represents the fact that we're into you, Lord, and that you're in us. And God, I pray today then that you would give me words from your mouth, from your heart, God, uh, imploring, not, not from disgust and not from slamming down and not because you want to curse anybody, Lord, You want to remove the curse from us that's already upon us because of the devil and his spells and the sin that we've already committed. And so, God, might we hear your voice that would continue to pull us out of the miry clay and, Lord, set our feet on the high places. And, Lord, that you would want to benefit and bless our lives. And so, God, I pray that you'd help me to no longer, Lord, bring away, bring myself away or tear away from your blessing, but rather instead to step into it, not because I deserve to be blessed again, but because you can't help it. And in your great love, Lord, you want to give us not only an abiding life, but you want to give us a blessed life, a life to the max. And so, Jesus, today, we turn to you, we come to you, and for those that don't know you, God, I pray that as they watch and observe us, that they would at least believe that we do believe and not just that we're faking it. But God, we come before you and we give you thanks for your great grace. and Help us in the midst of it and the power of your Holy Spirit to live lives in that reflect it, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've got your Bible, turn with me over to the book of James. Because there's this passage and it's what started all this what in the world thing going on. And I'd read it, I don't know how many hundred times. I mean, literally, because James is one of the books that I go to because it's just filled with practicality. But all of a sudden, man, it's one of those things, and I don't know if you do it, but it's like walking through your house and all of a sudden a rug that's been there all along, you suddenly stip your, your, you stub your toe on it, you trip and almost fall flat on your face. And it's like, how did I do that? You know, and because you know what's there. And this is one of those passages I knew it was here and I'd read it before, but suddenly it stumbled me. It made me stumble in a good way, made me fall into the arms of God and begin to go, wow, am I glad you told me now and not in the midst of a, a deathbed situation? Am I glad, God, that you would ring the bell in my heart and my mind and go, what about you, Steve? What about you? It starts out, and I think it's because that's what I normally looked at, was we don't have because we don't ask, and that's the way James chapter 4 opens up. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Now, what's interesting is, is different translations translate this differently. And uh, the part of it that I tend to lean toward now more than ever is that when he says among you, it's not just in the body, although it applies that way, because church groups and stuff like that can... Easily, the devil loves to bring antagonistic dissension. And so that can happen real easy. It can happen within families, happens within friends and all. The devil loves to divide and thus he conquers. But it's talking more here about me and talking about you personally. What causes fights and quarrels in you? 
There is this part, and the New Testament brings it out. Paul talks about it several times, about the conflict that exists. That part of us that I want to surrender to Christ, but I have this tendency to not. I want to do good, but I really don't always follow through. What causes these fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires? If I recall right, I mean, the irony of this is, and, and you don't see it in the word desires, but... But man, it says something to me at least. It's the root word of this area is where we get hedonism, hedonistic, heathens. It's all that type of thing. And, you know, that brings a certain picture to mind that's certainly not good, you know, because it's utterly distasteful that hedonism would be. But that's what James is using here. Don't they come from your, the hedonism that battles within you? That part that is the secret of secrets in your heart and mind that... Even your best friends, some of them don't know about. That part of you that you've hid, but that's there, that looks when you know nobody else is looking at you, that does when nobody's around you think that knows you. The deal not too long ago came up with Ashley Madison, and there's an advertising company that's going off of that, and they literally went and they found girls named Ashley Madison, and I've interviewed them, and trying to show this contrast of it, but... The term and phrase was something that intrigued many men and women, and it was a, a cheating site, so to speak. It was a way to have unattached affairs. And Julie, when she was back home at her home, she, the preacher there had done the research. I didn't, you know, but uh, he said he found out that there was every zip code in the United States except two. A small farming community, their zip code wasn't one of the two. So somebody from every zip code across the United States except two. And if you're like me, inquiring minds want to know, and don't you want to know what those two are? I didn't go look, but you will today. And some of you, leave your phones alone. Stay on the Bible app. Don't go over to something else right now to find out. But that's all we know at this point in time. But God knew all along. He not only knew the zip code. He knew the phone, the computer, whatever else. He didn't need electronic gadgets to do it. He saw it. More than likely, if every zip code, there had to be some Christians in there. Shame on them, and would we want to dig out and expose? I have no desire to. But shame, we can't outrun it when we know. And the fear factors that rise up wondering, will somebody discover, and who all does know, and what will they do if they do? And it's just like we've seen happen in our Congress, you know, in the Washington, D.C., various recognitions and of course the media it all depends on how they want to spin it but the next thing you know it's just easier to bow out not admitting fault but there's times that there are and there's other times it's the accusation and in america anymore it's not innocent till proven guilty if the media is against you is it automatically guilty and so you hang your head and you walk away I mention that because, you know, but what, what is that? That's this inner thing. That's this hedonism that's looking. And it's not just in that. There are all kinds of things. I mentioned last week this underground web that is out there. And, and man, God, please don't ever let me find it. Because I just don't need to open Pandora's box. How about you? I already have enough things that I look back at in my life. And why did I ever take that first look or do that first thing or taste or touch or whatever it may have been? And there should be a part inside of us, I think, that is grieved that we did. We don't deny it. And at the same time, but because of Christ, we don't have to live in it. But yet, there's a part that once that sensation has been awakened, what happens? Oh, man, it is really hard to put out the fire. And that's what's phenomenal it is. It's like a smoldering fire that can continue. And, and it's no different than, than any addiction I mean, we've all got them. Some just are either hidden so well or are socially acceptable or whatever, but we all have them. It's that same thing. It's that easiest place for us to go when we feel stressed or overwhelmed, we revert back to because we find some sort of relief in it. And yet the truth is we don't, do we? It's short-lived at best, whatever relief it is that we might get. Short-lived. It doesn't fulfill. It doesn't complete. I mean, how many of you have gone on a trip no offense, but Nancy just went on a cruise, you know, or anything that way. I don't want to point at anybody. But how many of us have gone on a trip and thought, man, this is going to be the greatest. And, oh, finally, I get to do what everybody else has done. And you get back home and it wasn't all that you thought it would be. Or now the bills come due. And that's just the way it is, right? No matter what we do, there's, there's sometimes this lag in between that it either isn't all that we thought it would be. It was pepped up to be or we believed all the commercials or 
It costs more than what we wanted to pay, and that's the way the devil works. And I'm not down on trips or cruises or whatever you want to do, fly to the moon. You know, it's not that. All I want you to stop and think about is a little bit of that. What causes these conflicts in you? And one of the biggest conflicts that didn't exist prior to Jesus Christ was the fact that we could do what we want to do. And the only thing we had to do was to answer to our parents or our friends. But once you accept Christ, now you are clearly aware, even though we kind of knew before, but once you say, Jesus, I want you to be Lord and Savior, now we need to answer to him because that's what you do when he is Lord. And what Christ is concerned about are those things that have forever drained life from us because he wants to give us an abundant life. That's his desire. But we have such a bent on things that we know what we like and want to do that we don't believe he knows what he's talking about because he's God. But Jesus wasn't just God. He was a God that got into flesh and bones and came down here. He, he was an eternal spirit, but yet at the same time was vulnerable to temptation. And it was the devil, as we looked at last week, that said to him as he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. He said, you know, if you'll just bow down to me, I'll give them all to you. I don't know how many things there were within those kingdoms. I'm sure they've exaggerated, become even more prolific now. I don't believe it was just the head of state and countries. I think it was the drug world. I think it was the underground. I think it was the, you know, the mafia. I think it was all these kingdoms, all the powerful things of the world Jesus could have had at his disposal if he just bowed down to the devil. And he said, but the word says, worship the Lord your God and him only. Man, we need to learn that phrase because those things come up in our mind and the devil doesn't present himself before us standing there with a pitchfork in the hand and the red devil suit. If he did, it would be easier at least. But because he oftentimes doesn't even appear, it's just a thought in our mind. And that's what James goes on to talk about in places. He said, You're, we're enticed and by our own evil desires, we're dragged away. And he talks about you know, one thing leading to another and it's this progressive thing. And what it ends up leading to is, anybody know the answer? Death, death. But like Adam and Eve, they found out that they ate a fruit and it did bring about death, but they didn't physically die, just something died inside of them and it changed everything and we inherited it from them. But now I, I mention this all because I want you to realize that when this says your desires at battle within, I want to encourage you. I don't know what your desires are. I want to encourage you to do what I'm trying to do and it's not fun and I don't like looking at but. What are my desires, God? I want to ask you, first of all, do you have anything that you know combats or the desire for this keeps you from getting closer to God? Most of us are aware of something that is our biggie, you know. Have you recognized it? Do you pray about it instead of just being ashamed of it or embarrassed or trying to hide it? Do you not just ask God for help, but do you have any close enough friends that you can ask them to help you? And are you bold enough to even say, and hold me accountable? That takes a lot because that's vulnerability. That's difficult to do unless you know, and it's kind of that, I'll show you mine if you show me yours, and then we can, we've got you know, leverage against each other, right? But isn't it sad that within the church we don't have that openness that we can trust and know that if I share something with you, it will go nowhere else. But it's because even that's a desire. What? Well, if I know a secret, I want to let somebody else know I know a secret, but then if you tell them I've got a secret, they want to know what it is. And if you don't tell them, they'd believe that you don't. Well, no, I know something you'd love to know, but I can't tell you. You ever do that? Isn't that stupidity? But we do that. And that's what I'm saying. These desires that we have are so strange. So I would encourage you. One, do you, have, do you know what your desires are? Two, do they even conflict with Christ? Or have you ever asked that? Or have you segregated it, and which means that over here is my church life and God life and the good things and go to heaven thing, but over here is just a little bit of hell. I tell, I you know, I kind of wade into the pool every once in a while. I encourage you. What are your desires? Is it even at a point of battles any longer? Have you just given into it? Because that's one way to give up the battle. But James says, you know, they battle within you. You want something, you don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. So you quarrel and you fight. You do not have because you don't ask God. And when you ask, you don't receive because you ask with what? Wrong motives. Huh? That's what James said. That there's prayers that God doesn't answer because it's like, that's not going to benefit you. 
and you're not doing it out of love to help somebody else. You want it for yourself. You ask with wrong motives that you can spend what you get on. Here comes that word that follows desires, pleasures. Have you ever taken the inventory and looked back at what at one time you thought was a great pleasure and now it's not? Isn't it weird how as you go through life, those things change? Isn't it amazing back in the day when I was thrilled to come home and look, mommy, I got a gold star. Anybody else? I mean, accomplishment. There's nothing wrong with that. But boy, we know now gold stars, you can buy them at the Walmart and stick them all over your place. Give yourself a gold star. That's our day and age. Hey, man, there's nobody does anything wrong. Phooey. But everybody gets a star. Why? Because, well, we don't want to hurt their personnel. <laughs> but I want you to see this, folks. I mean, James is so practical here, isn't he? We do want to get what we get for us to spend on our pleasures. Amen? It, it's amen. It's God's word. But that's not the part that I really want to get to. Here's where it gets terrible. It goes from bad to worse. James says, you adulterous people. Adultery. Wow. Some of you are saying, well, that doesn't apply to me. Some of you are trying to hold your head up, and I'm not out here to focus and to try to illuminate, but I want you to know what it's talking about here it isn't necessarily husband and wives adultery. It's better or deeper than that. It's worse than that. Because this is talking about marriage with the Lamb. This is talking about Jesus Christ being the husband and we the church or me the church because it's each individual and it's us collectively. We are the bride of who? Christ. And so what James is going into is he's beginning to now sift through and get beyond practicality and get down into the nitty gritty and say, man, you need to consider this. This is so vital. He said adulterous people. I mean, we read right by that because I'm not, or at least I didn't get caught type of deal, right? No, we need to look at this, you adulterous people. Don't you know? And, and here is, so if you've got it, I, I, I didn't look at the bulletin today. If you've got a take-home box, drove with the space usually tries to do that. I want you to write this question out so that this week, every day, you can go to God and ask him and say, God, how does this apply to me? Don't you know, James asked, that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but how many of you knew that? Well, some of you, like me, you've read it before, but do we know it? Do we own it? Do we know it inside out? Friendship with the world is equivalent to hatred to God. Next question. How many of you care? Because that's the part that got, I mean, the hook in my mouth was, God, do I care? How many of you instantly want to go into a defense of, well, I love God and I'm not a friend of the world? Why are you so defensive so quickly? And that was a part that, at least with me, and again, presuming it as your pastor and a part of this, you know, being in this church together, that it's because God knows that he needed somebody like me that's just like you. And I've got to believe that if I growing up in a nice little Sunday school kind of a home and being in church every time the doors were open and all this stuff, if, if I have to look at this and go, wow, it should be an instant no-brainer, right? But no, man, for me, it was like, wait a minute, God. Could I be hating you because of my attachment, my friendship with the world? Wait a minute, God, I... I don't want to, of course I'm your friend, not the world, but how do I know? How do we qualify that? And that's where I want you to know, I don't know how deep you guys want to go with this. But I know for me, I don't want to just stop and go, well, I know the right answer. Jesus loves me and I love Jesus. But Jesus is the one that said, you can't love God and money. But I don't think we like to look at that and go, how do I know whether I love money or not? God said, because you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. 
What's it look like if I'm devoted to God? What's it look like if I'm devoted to money? How's that bear out or play out? Do I care? That's what it comes back to. Do I care? And I'm here to tell you, I do care. I want to know that I'm a friend with God. I don't want to know it because the Bible tells me. I don't want to do it because we sing that song. I'm a friend of God. I'm a friend of God. I want to know that God says, you are my friend. I want to know that I do for him what I would do for a real friend. I want to not just sing what a friend we have in Jesus. I want to be his friend. And a friend in need is a friend indeed. And what Jesus Christ needs for us to do is to what? He says it all kinds of different ways. Primarily love him, but then love others, love our enemies, love. I mean, there's no end to what we're supposed to love. But do we? And I would have to say if A equals B and B equals C, then somewhere along the line, the more that I love not the world, but the people and the lost souls of my enemies, the more of a friend I am with God. How about you? And that friendship then I need to look at and say, I need to qualify and say, God, would you through the power of your Holy Spirit give and illuminate my eyes to see what things own me that I don't really possess, but I become possessed by them. What things, Lord, in my life vie for your attention? That's why I did this title or whatever it was today about not holding hands. My wife, because of my profession, has seen me hold a lot of ladies' hands over the years. Yes. And there's one thing about me holding a lady's hand, and there's a difference between that and holding hands with a lady. Would you agree? And that's what I want you to visualize, I guess, not me holding somebody else, but I guess you could say that even. If you saw me, especially if I was walking through the mall, holding hands with a lady, what would you say? It better be Julie. It better be Julie. <laughs> No, I, I got a feeling most of you would come up, half of you would get your phones out and take a picture, <laughs> right? Because you want the evidence, you know, because you're going to use it for leverage somewhere along the line. But I mean, some of you would call Julie, some of you would confront me. Why? Because that's not right. And yet in the church, when it comes to our greatest bride that we're to be connected to, we're supposed to be holding hands with the Lord, and yet... We oftentimes are strolling through all kinds of things in this world, holding hands with the world. And we don't even think anything about it because we're so used to it. Some of you and me, we're aware of people that have, I mean, it's like some of the politicians, you've heard stories about them, even past presidents and different things like that, where they had the wife of nobility, but then they had the, not wife, but the girls on the side. And we would know that's, but we've grown to, oh, well, nothing surprises us anymore. Then now that we've got the high tech age, I mean, shoot, you don't even have to go any place because you can do it with a computer screen or with your phone. And I'm not trying to be graphic here. I'm not trying to plant any ideas. I'm just trying to say, isn't that amazing? Not that we can do that. Isn't it amazing that we can participate or think about it and, whoa. Because the world has told us it's okay. That's the world that Jesus Christ will crush. That's the world that he said de the devil is the prince of it. That's just part of the kingdom and living within the kingdom of the world of what you can go ahead and have. And I'm telling you folks, that's what James was brokenhearted about here. He's not using this adulterous term flippantly. He's not trying to do it in a condemning fashion. He's trying to say, wake up and can't you see? You can't be a friend of the world and still be a friend with God. Because ultimately what it truly is, is hatred towards God. A despising nature, a, a degrading type, you know, forget you type thing. You owe it to me. And I hear people that are church people say that stuff. God doesn't care about sin anymore. I've got his grace. He's forgiven it already, so I just as well go on and sin. Some of you have had spouses that were big enough that in the midst of your sin, they forgave you. But would there be anything worse than that happening and they forgive and then they still, the, after their forgiveness, you still go back out on them again? No. 
But that doesn't make the nightly news. There aren't movies that really show much of that side of thing because the movies show all the sensational side of things. So who do you think most of the, world, the movies are from? The world's point of view or God's? It's one reason I love the war room. It comes the closest to showing how this works. But I think it's vital that we at least, folks, folks love God enough that we care and say, Lord, have I hurt you? Lord, are you embarrassed? Lord, have I embarrassed myself? God, do we have a great relationship? God, am I taking you for granted? God, where in my world do you see me being friends with the world that arouses your jealousy? And I don't know anybody else this past week that asked you those questions. So on behalf of God, I'm asking you. But I'm not finger pointing. I'm saying it's what he's asking me. And I want to tell you I'm concerned. I want to learn how to evaluate. And I hope over the next few weeks we can look at some of these passages that would cause us to evaluate and say, according to God's word, the worldview should be different than it has been for us. What do you think? Because I don't want to find out after I get there. As I mentioned, I think it was on Wednesday night, there's a preacher I heard recently say, we don't have to worry about the judgment. We won't go through the great white throne judgment. Okay, buddy, I'd rather be prepared than I would to presume. And that's what scares me is I think that our worldview has got us to be so sloppy with God, so sloppy with building this relationship with him that is precious, that the only time we think about it is if we lost a loved one. Other than that, we're on our own because God's got to take us because I said the magic words and did the magic deed. And I'm just saying, I don't think that's a life worth living. And that's what others have said. The unexamined life just isn't worth living. Still others have talked about other things with life. And I think that it's vital that folks that sometimes we look at it. Uh, one of the passages that, that Proverbs has in it that, that I forget. But it's the one that says, guard your heart. Nobody else will do it for you. Guard your heart. We are susceptible, folks. I have been angry. Paul says, the word of God says, in your anger, don't sin. I've been angry and I sinned because this emotion blew up and there was a part that felt good. I've confessed to you before that I understand what it is to be a one and a half or two year old. I sometimes want to bite people. <laughs> you tell me, bite me, I might. <laughs> Not because, you know, there's just something about, right? And isn't that what we're doing when we throw one of those little temper tantrums? We just wish there was something between our teeth that we we're biting down on. And, and I'm not excusing. I'm not saying that's okay. I'm saying I'm almost embarrassed to admit that. But that's that part of the world that's still in me. And I just think that it's vital that we look and say, wait a minute, man. If I really cherish God, and if I dare to say I love God, then do you not believe that it's worth qualifying? Because if I tell you I love Julie and you see me with somebody else, what's your estimation of that? And here's the kicker. Because Jesus said this. The way you judge others is what? The way I'll judge you. And so if you already know in your mind that you would judge it that way, then I'm just saying use that same judgment now and say, God, help me to see my relationship with you in that same vein. Where? Do I, am I playing with adultery in my spiritual life? Where am I compromising the purity of our relationship and my promise to you, God? Where, God, have I gone from helping the world by holding somebody's hand to where I'm holding hands with them now? And I'm not talking so much about individuals as I am. What are the things of this world that the Bible warns us about and says, be on your guard and be careful about? So he says, you adulterous people, don't you know? And again, I want all of you to know there's no buddy that I'm preaching at today. I'm preaching about myself. I'm preaching about this part that I so easily and glibly read through till all of a sudden God caused me, he stuck his foot out and made me fall into it. Don't you know friendship with the world equals hatred towards God? Anyone, and this is the part that is my responsibility or yours. Anyone who what? chooses so it is a choice isn't it it's a choice it's a conscientious choice 
anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes. Not instantly, but gradually, you become. And isn't it that way with relationships? I've met people that I liked right off the bat. I've met people that I felt like I've known my whole life. Any of you understand that? Um, then I've met people, some, like some of you, when you met me, you might have liked me at first, and then the more you get to know me, the less you like me. That happens too, doesn't it? Because what? Well, what you saw, you begin to go, oh, man, I don't know. That's not what I thought that it was. And that's where any relationship is in a continual state, or it should be, because there's no such thing as really a static friendship. By static, what I mean is it begins and stays the same. It's what I've told you about faith. It's what I've told you about our belief in God, that it's okay for it to begin here and it can be mustard, side, mustard seed size. But if it remains there, that's not good because it's not growing. It means it's not been planted. It's not an increasing. But any relationship that stays static is not much of a relationship. I can look back with my mom and dad, and I did love them as a little kid because they gave me good stuff and they let me do what I wanted to do. And as I got older, they quit letting me do everything I wanted to do. Anybody relate? And now, as a child, I didn't like them as much as I liked them before. And I would equate love and likes at that age. How about you? Because we loved ice cream. We loved to go to the pool. We loved. So if I liked it, I loved it, right? I knew I was supposed to love God, and so I did. But then as I got older, I found out that there were things that God didn't want me to do. I didn't like that. And that's what James is basically saying, if I can go ahead and kind of put it down into a childlike level, is sometimes we don't like God, and so what do we do? We run to something we like, and we never develop a love that's based upon what he's done for us and our response to it in spite of what we feel like God's allowing to happen in our life. And so I want to look at this, but I want you to think about the choices you've made. Anyone that chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think that Scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely? God has placed his Holy Spirit inside of us because he didn't just want to save us. He wanted us to become his child. And he knew that with our old nature, we couldn't do that. But folks, a part of what we've got to do to help the Holy Spirit out, so to speak, is to walk away and get rid of this old nature. But if we never look to say, what is my nature, we'll never know and you can never overcome it. This relationship with God begins. It continues to build. A friendship with the world starts and it continues. Tell me, when you took that first drink, it was just a drink. Now, I wish that we could have every eye, bow, every eye closed and head bowed and you could raise your hands and tell me because I think that I would be probably at least 80% correct to say the first drink you took, it didn't taste good. I'm not talking about your mother's milk either. Okay, so sorry. But the first taste that you had probably didn't taste good. But it was a beginning. And it increases, right? And you learn to develop a taste for that. Coffee. How many of you love coffee the first time you ever drank it? Okay, a few of you guys. But most of us, it was like, boo, who would drink that? Especially in the old days when you had a bunch of grounds in it too, you know, or it wasn't really hot, you know. But, but we learn to develop it, and then the next thing you know, we crave it, right? That's that beginning that continues to increase. And I'm telling you folks, that's available with God as well. God doesn't always taste good the first bite you have. But I guarantee you come back and you feast again at his table and you drink what he offers you to drink and you eat what he offers you to eat. I promise you, you will develop a taste for it. And I would rather be addicted to God than I am addicted to all the different things that have crossed my path in my life. And so Paul talks about discipline so that we challenge ourselves and we, we intentionally say, no, I won't. And some of us become bingers in that regard. We have a discipline that goes up into a certain point and then suddenly nobody's around or we have a bad week. The next thing you know, you dump into whatever it is and it can be all these disorders that there are. I mean, I'm not making fun of them at all, but isn't it amazing how aware we are of so many disorders and there's a group for this and a group for that. And the truth of it is, as Christians, we all have disorders. And what we should do if we love God is begin to help each other overcome Whatever it is that's been owning us before it's what? Too late. Because there comes a point in the time where we dump in so wholeheartedly that it begins to feel like it's life. And instead of us owning our life, 
our life is being zapped from us. And Jesus Christ promised just the opposite. He said, what you've got is a faltering life. You're doing everything you can to prop it up and make yourself look good. But he said, let me tell you what I offer you is an abundant life. You will grow in everything if you'll hold on to me. I will even give you the new juice from the root, so to speak. I'll give you the new juices that will allow you. I'll give you my Holy Spirit so that you'll develop this taste and you'll suddenly find that there is joy not just in serving and loving Jesus, but in serving and loving the world. Not because you have to, but because I'll give you a new desire that you'll want to for me. That you'll be my bestie. You'll go out there and that you will share. So wrap up this morning then. And there's no way to be done with this message, but I'm torn here between two different passages. So which one do I want to use? Um, let me go to this one. One in the book of Mark. And I'll go here because I think that it, it shows something in chapter 2, Mark chapter 2. As you're turning to it, let me read to you something that was passed on to me this week. I think it's pretty good and it fits in here with it. Uh, I'll hold that. We'll do that for communion. All right. Mark chapter 2. In this passage of Mark, and, and some of the Bibles actually put a, you know, things about faithful friends or this or that. Most preachers have preached about it. I have in this story, and most of us are aware of it. Um, Don Francisco even wrote a song about it. And I, I think it is. It's an amazing, amazing story. So Mark, book of Mark, gospel of Mark, tell him about Jesus, something he did. A few days later, chapter 2, verse 1, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he'd come home. This was his hometown base area. Now, we know he was originally from Nazareth, but, but Capernaum suddenly became kind of his go-to place when he wasn't in Jerusalem or going back and forth, different things that way. So he'd, he'd come home. People heard that. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. If I have any disappointments that are primary, as I tried to listen to some of the stuff with the Pope, I didn't hear many Bible quotations. I'm not saying that because I'm throwing eggs at him or against him. I'm saying that's just an observation I made. And as I make that observation, I realize that that's my duty to you is to share Bible verses. And I know that I might share a verse and do like today and expound upon it. But I want you to know what the Word of God says. I want you to be thinkers. I don't want me to think for you. I don't want you to automatically adapt my thoughts. No, I want you to begin to read. And I want you to see here that what Jesus did, even though he could do anything, that his primary mission was to convey to us what heaven was about and what it took to get there and what the kingdom of God is like, not the kingdom of the world. And so these people are gathering. They, they're intrigued. But notice what did he give them? The word of God. He preached the word of God to them. Some, some men came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four of them. So four guys bring somebody with them. And we're not told, but it would seem that it would be kind of one of those things. We, if you saw any of it, again, the clips, there were people that had uh, various uh, children or adults with disabilities. They tried to put them in the path of the Pope so that he would bless them. Well, Jesus wasn't the Pope. Jesus was Jesus. And he was drawn to certain people. There were everyday things going around him, but there were certain things that he saw. Well, these four buddies heard that Jesus was in town. And, and I don't have time to go into the whole message, but... I kid you not, we've done stuff in school and different things like that where we had to carry somebody, and it's just not easy to do, is it? It's amazing how that dead weight becomes, you know, if they're not helping you, it's, it's just tough and difficult. So I don't know how long they walked. I don't know how much the journey was, but they, they decided. It doesn't say what they did about talking about it. They didn't tell their buddy, hey, dude, you want us to do this, don't you? It, it, they just chose to do it for him. So they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they couldn't get him to Jesus because of the crowd, people all around, standing room only, even outside, they couldn't get to Jesus because of the crowd. They made an opening in the roof above Jesus and after digging through it, which that's why I like Mark's version because it's legit. They dug through the earthen uh, roof, the clay and all the stuff that was there. They dug down through it. So here, if Jesus were me, and I don't want to pretend that he is, but it'd be like me teaching you, and all of a sudden, sawdust and plaster, and, or not plaster, but drywall and insulation start coming down through in shingles. I'd be like, Keith, do something about this, man. I mean, come on. This is your job. You keep that from happening, you know? But, so this is coming down around him, and he's teaching. 
I don't know whether Jesus stopped or continued on, but they made a hole in the roof above Jesus after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. That's a big hole. But I want to tell you, if you've already carried him for a mile, your arms are already tired, now you dug down through a roof, and now you're going to lower this dead weight down in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, the paralytic son, your sins are forgiven. What did Jesus see? Their faith. He didn't see the paralyzed guy's faith. He saw four of them that didn't do anything to gain anything for themselves. And he loved it. Can I ask you this past week, was there anything you did out of your faith that was purely and totally for somebody else? Because what I want you to know, it brings about a change. Jesus didn't say what those friends wanted to hear. He said, son, your sins are forgiven. And I believe he did it for a proper order, number one. What was that man's greatest needs? Healing? That's what most would think. No. The soul being saved. That's why I'm concerned about, I don't want to commit adultery with God. I don't want to be a friend with the world if that's what it means, is I hate God. The biggest thing I need from God is forgiveness of my sins. I need Jesus' blood for heaven. I don't want to lose it. But if I need it, and I know that's the most important thing, then I need to want everybody else in the world to know it as well. Do you? Are you concerned just about your own life, or have you grown in this developed relationship with God to the point now you've begun to have a love for the world? Steve Camp used to sing a song, and maybe he still does. And in it, he talked about something that to me was so poignant, it just was unreal. He said, do you care enough that you can taste the salt in their tears that they cry? That's gross if you're thinking of it that way, but it's not if you're being compassionate. Anyway, the way the story goes on, that he got his thing to the religious leaders, and they started throwing a fit about who are you to forgive sins. And Jesus very coolly says, all right. Just so that you'll know, I have the power to forgive sins on this earth. Get up. And the guy walked out, healed as well. So he did the double blessing. And what Jesus Christ left for us to do was to continue on his work and his teachings. And if we can unhitch ourselves from being tied to the world, I think you'll be amazed at the things that God can do through you and through us together as a church. Will you stand? Will you respond as he leads?